So yesterday we analyzed the Miller compensated op amp thoroughly. That is, we analyzed the transfer function and uh, looked at the values of poles and zeros. Uh, of course, first of all, it creates a right half plane zero, which, as we will see, is not good news. But it does move the poles further apart. In particular, it moves one of the poles to higher frequency, which allows you to have higher bandwidth. Now, when I say higher bandwidth, I am comparing it to the case where you simply increase the pulse capacitor. Okay. Although our original analogy was like increasing the pulse capacitor, uh, that is having a Miller capacitor across the second stage, we said is just as the same as just the same as having a larger uh, capacitor at the first output. It actually does better than that. Okay. This is our op amp with the capacitor CC. Okay. So what did we see? Now we can write the transfer function as the DC gain times there is a factor corresponding to a right half plane zero, which is why I write it as. Uh, 1 minus S by Z1. Okay. Z1 is positive. This 0 is in the right half plane. And I have this one. Right. Now, Z1 we know exactly. What is it? What's the value of the 0? Hmm? GM2 by CC. Okay. And the first pole, it's G01 divided by plus there is some other factor, right? Plus C1 plus C2 times G01 by G02. But for the most part, will be perfectly fine by taking only these parts or maybe even only this one first term okay because that is expected to be kind of overwhelmingly dominant right and you have to use all those approximations so that you can get through the calculations at all and p2 we saw was some conductions related to GM2, that is what was special about it, okay? Because there is feedback around GM2 now, right? So you get a conductance, although it's just a voltage control current source. If you didn't have any feedback, uh, when you disable the input, right? When you said V equal to zero, this current source would become zero. This voltage would, uh, this voltage would consequently also become zero. And then this current would become zero. So this would become an open circuit. Now what happens is if V is zero, this becomes zero. But not necessarily that one, right? There is feedback around it. So if you look between these two terminals, there is a conductance contribution from GM2, which is equal to that. Okay. Plus GO2, which is already there. And then uh, the denominator we have whatever is contributed by this network of capacitors between this terminal and that, okay? Which is C2 plus the whole thing, series combination of that, okay? Now, these formulas are kind of painful to remember, and if you swap some terms, you will be in trouble. But if you understand the reasoning behind it, it's quite easy, right? Now, these are all, uh, the poles are approximate, okay? Now, what is it that we want to do? Uh, find the 
uh, V not by V, which is the open loop gain of the op amp. That is interesting. But what we want is this will be placed in some feedback loop, and uh, you have to assess the stability and add the appropriate value of CC so that it becomes stable and so on. Now, as I as we discussed some time back, if you are making a general purpose op amp, you assume that you will make a unity gain amplifier with k equal to one and adjust the value of CC for that one. Okay. And you know, just for completeness, is GM1, GM2 by GO1, GO2. Okay. So now, first let's in fact assume that we will make a unity gain amplifier. The thing with the unity gain amplifier is that uh, essentially the loop gain becomes the op amp gain. That's all. Right. So you can simply talk about the uh, unity loop gain frequency of the gain bandwidth product of the op amp by itself, and that will be the same as the loop gain. Okay. Otherwise, you will have another factor k depending on what is in feedback. So in this case, the loop gain is the same as that. Okay. So what will be the phase margin? How will you? What do you have to do to calculate the phase margin? First, you need to find the unity loop gain frequency, or in this case, the unity gain frequency of the op amp by itself, right? And what is that? Please try to calculate and use appropriate approximations. That's important here. We'll assume this, and A naught is GM1, GM2 by GO1, GO2, and P1 is GO1 divided by some other term. I mean, what is a reasonable approximation here? What did I mean by that? Obviously, the first term is dominant. Okay, if GM2 by GO2 is a large enough value, this is, I think, a very good approximation. The only other risk is whether C1 and C2, if they become much more than CC, but this is not likely to be the case. Okay, for given value of C1 and C2, you will end up having to use CC, which is comparable. Okay, so the expression becomes extremely simple. What is it? Many of you have got it. GM1 by CC. So this is actually it turns out a very good approximation to the unity gain frequency of the op amp. And in fact, there is some intuition behind this also. Uh, I won't go into that right now. All right. So this is a very good approximation. Okay. Now, given this, essentially this we needed to know. To evaluate phase margin and so on, because we need to know what the unity gain frequency is. Okay. By the way, if oh yeah, let me get to that later. Now, what will be the phase at the unity gain frequency? What will be the phase shift to the op amp? This is the transfer function of the op amp, right? So, what will be the phase shift? There are, I mean, how many different components are there to the phase shift? There are one zero and two poles, right? So, what is the phase shift uh, because of the zero? Sign was? Yeah. So, is it a phase lag or a phase lead? Lag. This is a right half plane zero. That is why it is bad news. Okay. So, with poles, of course, we always assume left half plane poles because we assume that the op amp by itself is also stable. So, a pole always gives you a phase lag. But uh, a zero, if it's in the left half plane, it gives you phase lead. And if it's in the right half plane, it gives you phase lag. Okay. So, this actually makes uh, stability worse. This is bad news. And 
what does it mean actually so if you think about it zero so 1 minus s by z1 okay what does this represent in the time domain a factor 1 minus s by z1 what does it represent in the time domain if the input to such a system is x of t what would the output be huh yeah s by z1 is what derivative okay so the output would be x of t itself minus 1 by z1 that okay so what it means is that this is actually taking you in the opposite direction right so let's say x of t was something like this so x of t did that so what would this additional factor be it will actually be negative so initially it will fall down and it will go up so that's one way of thinking about phase lag okay it is actually delaying the if the input was a ramp it's effectively delaying the ramp right okay whereas if you had plus then it's like prediction it is advancing the ramp okay so that will effectively make the negative feedback appear earlier so a left half line zero is good for stability a right half line zero is not okay anyway uh, because the op amp transfer function is this the uh, phase at the unity loop gain frequency or the unity gain frequency is minus tan inverse omega u by z1 minus tan inverse omega u by p2 p1 minus tan inverse omega u by p2 so all three give you some phase lag okay how much is this tan inverse omega u by p1 nearly pi by 2 because that's basically tan inverse of the dc loop gain right so this is pi by 2 so i'll have minus pi by 2 and how much is omega u by z1 omega u by z1 is gm1 by cc which is omega u divided by gm2 by cc okay so this is minus tan inverse gm1 by gm2 okay and finally we also have minus tan inverse omega u by p2 okay now we can make various approximations for that i'll, I'll for now i will uh, leave it like this okay and this has to be greater than let's say minus 120 degrees or something right this is the phase for phase margin you have to add 180 degrees to this number okay sorry yeah okay and this is the equation from which you will determine cc right because this is some i mean once you choose gm1 and gm2 that is some fixed number the phase lag because of the zero that's actually convenient for us to calculate we don't have more complicated expressions so now uh, let's say you want the phase margin to be 60 degrees then you have this equation tan inverse omega u by p2 omega u depends on cc p2 also depends on cc let's not worry about how to solve it but you know that there will be some particular value of cc that will satisfy this equation and that's how you pick the value of cc this is okay so this is how you get the uh uh get the value of cc because that's what you have to determine you have some stages gm1 i mean you can think of uh, c1 as a property of the first stage that's not quite true because c1 will have characteristics from the first stage as well as the second stage and so on so c1 and c2 are once you choose gm1 and gm2 they are fixed for that you have to uh, now insert the value of cc 
that will make the whole thing stable okay to some phase margin the phase margin i mean i said it's 60 degrees but it can be anything it can be 70 50 whatever you want okay so in the tutorial for instance when you are asked to calculate the value of cc this is what you have to do now there are further approximations we can make so that we can get some quick numbers out and then also uh, slightly more complicated ones but in any case even if uh, you didn't have anything you can always let's say sweep the value of cc see what this tan inverse omega u by p2 comes out to be and then pick the right value right that's possible i mean you may not be able to do this by hand but i start with cc is zero and then i know that okay let me say that this uh, the second term happens to be 10 degrees so this can contribute 20 degrees so i'll go on sweeping cc and then until i find 20 degrees and then i use that value of c okay so what the message i'm trying to convey is okay if you end up with a nonlinear equation that's one of the things that you can do right you can simply try by trial and error you can try to pick this value uh now what can you so when we wrote all the op amp structure we said we needed two stages to get enough gain okay with one stage we won't get enough gain but we didn't really have anything to say about the absolute values of gm1 and gm2 they could be anything right as long as uh, gm1 by gm2 is let's say 100 and gm2 by gm2 is also 100 the absolute value of gm1 and gm2 we didn't care about but now looking at this expression can you make some comment on how you would have to choose gm1 and gm2 which one yeah why clearly i mean we want if gm1 equals gm2 this itself contributes 45 degrees okay and you have the second pole as well so this is just not going to work in fact you have to choose gm2 to be much higher than gm1 okay so this is some constraint that you get from stability okay so this is of course true of any op amp that you make a two stage op amp the second uh, stage transconductance itself will be higher than the first one okay and if you recall the uh, problem from the previous tutorial i think i had given gm2 to be 10 times gm1 it may or may not be 10 times but it has to be higher okay if it is indeed 10 times what's the contribution of this huh 0.1 what radians yeah 5.7 degrees okay for small arguments inverse tangent is the same as the argument itself so if gm1 by gm2 is 0.1 you have 0.1 radians or 5.7 degrees of phase shift if you want 60 degrees of phase margin you can let the last term have 24.3 or around 24 degrees of phase okay so that's how much room you have this is okay this is the desired phase margin and this is the equation to determine cc okay and cc influences both p2 and omega in uh, most real problems you will not get a closed form expressions for something okay something that you have to calculate so it may be an implicit equation and so on so the important thing is first of all to be able to set up the equations correctly solving i mean in uh, if you have to do it you can resort to uh, numerical solvers and things like that and then uh, also uh, to get an idea of what is going on it's not that uh, the numerical solver gives you a number you uh, may have any you may not have any idea of whether it's uh, right or wrong and also more importantly if that number is not what you want you have to move things in let's say the circuit or any system in a way that 
it is the number that you want in fact that is design right the most of the things that we teach are necessary i mean all these equations and approximations and so on so that uh, you know which way to move things when things go wrong okay when things are not exactly where they should be so uh, for that we need to resort to some approximation So let's see. Omega u is j m one by c c. This is simple enough. And then p two, I said, is j m two c c by c c plus c one plus j o two divided by. There was something else also related to j o one, right? It had c c plus c two by c c plus c one or something. Here I have C two plus C C C one by C C plus C one. Okay. Now again, this is kind of too painful to sit and uh, work things by hand. So first of all, what approximations can you make? Yeah, I think that's actually a no-brainer. I mean, these two can be neglected. And we retain only the first one, right? J M two times C C by C C plus C one. Is it okay? So if I Take this expression and take the tangent on both sides, right? I mean, this entire thing in the inside the argument is nothing but phase shift. U to P two at omega U. Okay, so nothing special. I mean, you know G M one and G M two. You know the whole thing. You know the phase part. So omega U itself comes out to be G M one by C C, and P two was that whole thing, right? G M two C C by C C plus C one, and here we have C two plus C C C one by C C plus C one. Equals tan something, and this is a fixed number. Okay, so anyway, this looks messy, but all you get is a quadratic equation for CC, which you can solve. Okay. So if you know C1 and C2, all you have to do is to solve this quadratic equation. Okay. Any questions about this? So again, I mean, there are uh, numerical values given in the problem in the tutorial. Please try all of these things. But whenever you solve things like this, be careful. I mean, I see that many of you sometimes start substituting numerical values right from the beginning. So you will have equations with some symbols, some numerical values, and in circuits, the numerical values can be. I mean, if you have pico parrots, you will have things like 10 to the minus 12 and then all this stuff. When you take it to the other side, it becomes 10 to the 12. Very easy to miss out something and end up with a complete mess. Okay, so. Typically, uh, I mean, not always, but many times it's preferable to uh, carry out symbolic calculations and write out the final equation and then uh, use the numerical values. Okay. Otherwise, especially when you have uh, the numbers may vary like hugely in orders of magnitude, right? So you may get 
very confused while going from one step to the next. Okay. So I won't reduce this uh, further, but I think you can get the quadratic equation from this. In fact, if you make it a quadratic equation in uh, cc by c2, which is a dimensionless quantity, instead of cc square, I think you will get cc plus uh, c2 or cc plus c1. It is better. Okay. Yeah. Equating. Yeah, that you can't tell. I mean, that depends on the particular circuit, uh, whether C, C, uh, C1 and C2 are equal. But we can make one further approximation, which will even reduce this, uh, takes away this quadratic and gives us a linear equation. Okay. Any other questions about this? I mean, obviously, be careful if, uh, let's say, C1 and C2 are in the picofarad range, and you get CC to be either in the femtofarad or farad or something, I mean, it's very likely something completely wrong, okay? Yeah, one of the things also is when uh, you get numerical answers, you should make a judgment on whether uh, things are reasonable, right? So, Hari Ramchandran, who teaches electromagnetic waves, he was telling me that he had once given a problem. Uh, he had once given a problem in an exam about a spherical potato in a microwave and then uh, something about fields and so on. And the question was to estimate the size of the potato and the answers were all everywhere from millimeters to kilometers. So, I mean, this is clearly, <laughs> I don't know what kind of potato this is, but uh, it's not going to happen. Right? So, you should uh, make some uh, judgment of whether the numerical answers you get are reasonable. <laughs> So one further approximation we can make, uh, which is in fact not always true, but at least it gives you a first cut answer, which is that CC is much more than C1. Okay, what happens then? So the CC by CC plus C1 becomes one. CC by CC plus C1 becomes one. Okay, this this number becomes one if CC is much more than C1. So P2 becomes gm2 divided by c2 plus c1 okay the circuit intuition behind this is the following i mean what did we say yesterday uh, we have the we are looking at the impedance between this point and ground okay this is gm2 and we have c2 this is vo1 this is gm2 vo1 right C C and C1. What is the meaning of the approximation we just made? C C is a short, right? So that means that it's like that. So if I short this, what is the conductance contribution from this control source? What is it? What is the conductance we get from there? GM2, the input and output of GM2 are shorted. So, what is the conductance that we get? It is GM2, that's all, GM2 itself. So, we have a resistor of value 1 by GM2 and these two points are shorted. So, C1 and C2 are in parallel. So, I have C1 plus C2. So, the pole due to this is basically GM2 divided by C1 plus C2. So, that is the last approximation that we made. Okay, so the important thing here is that uh, CC drops out of P2, yes? Oh, whatever you do, okay, first of all, this is an approximation to do the calculation, but even this value of CC will be smaller than if you connect CC across C1 and make it uh, stable, okay? Because simply, I mean, this is much better. This moves P2 away and then P1 inwards, whereas R1 wasn't touching P2. And also, this is, a, this is a different thing. This is an approximation so that we can make the calculation. So, after that, you see whether you get CC to be uh, CC to be much more than C1 or not. In fact, the CC value that you get from here will be an underestimate compared to what you get from the quadratic, as far as I remember. Okay, you can try it out in the 
So the uh, the important quality of this approximation is that we will have uh, the same thing again. Uh, omega u by p2 should be tangent of something. That's something I listed previously. And omega u is gm2 by cc and gm1 by cc, and this is gm2 by c1 plus c2. Okay, equals tangent of this number, which is related to the phase margin. Okay, so what does it say? Cc should be. This is divided by. This one is even, I mean, there is nothing to solve here. You get the expression for uh, CC right away. So, this gives you the ballpark value, and very likely you will find that uh, CC is not much more than C1. Okay, actually, that depends on uh, other things. So, let's say you had a case where C2 was much more than C1, then this is likely to be a reasonable approximation. Okay. CC is also likely to come out to be much more than C1. But if C1 and C2 are of similar orders of order of magnitude, then CC will also be of similar order of magnitude. But anyway, you can calculate these things and see. Okay. And also, this kind of makes intuitive sense. You can see that the CC is proportional to actually this number is C1. Okay. C1 plus C2. Right, so that means that if you had more parasitic capacitors in the op amp to start with, you would have to use a larger capacitor to stabilize it. That kind of makes sense, right? If you didn't have any parasitics, there is nothing to stabilize, isn't it? So, if you have parasitics to large parasitics, you will have to have comparable uh, CC to stabilize that, okay? And if the GM1 is much smaller than GM2, then what happens is basically the unity gain frequency is GM1 by CC, right? So, if you have a smaller GM1, you need a smaller CC for the same unity gain frequency. So, that is why you get the proportionality to GM1. Okay. And then, this number here, the argument of the tangent, you can see it is pi by 2 minus the phase margin. Okay. So, the larger the phase margin, the smaller this number. So, what does it mean? The larger the phase margin, what, can, what will happen to the value of CC? You have to make it bigger. Okay. So, this kind of again makes sense because if you didn't care about phase margin, you won't put CC at all. But uh, and you will end up with a nearly unstable system. So if you want more and more phase margin, you will have to use the bigger and bigger CC. Okay. So in the extended tutorial, in fact, you are asked to do this. You calculate CC using this and using the quadratic equation and make comparisons. Okay. There are various approximations involved, right? We approximate the values of the roots because quadratic. Uh, roots are kind of painful to calculate, at least symbolically. And we also approximate the unity gain frequency to be the DC gain times the dominant pole. And we have various approximations for calculating the values of CC. So, the one, I mean, it's not a good idea to simply try and mug up the approximation. It's likely that you will somehow misremember the formula or something. So, you try it with every one of those things. And even the simplest approximation is okay, as long as you understand, state it clearly and do it. Okay, unless we state otherwise, you can use those. Otherwise, it becomes very painful. Okay, because remember, even the expression A0 times P1, okay, if you use this entire thing for P1, I mean, it's unwieldy. Okay, if you didn't use uh, A0 times P1 to be J1 by CC, you can only imagine how messy the calculations will be, but it will make no hardly any difference to the numerical result because that A0 times P1 being the uh, omega being uh, gm1 by cc is a very good approximation because all these other terms are going to be small okay any questions about any of these
So let's say I use the same op amp, not in a unity gain configuration, but as a non-inverting amplifier of gain k. So what changes do I have to make to everything I did so far for the phase margin I and mean, calculation is setting the value of CC and so on. One is of course if you make a standard op amp, you design CC for k equal to 1 and use the same op amp. And then in fact one of the questions asks you what happens if you do that. Now in those cases where you have freedom to choose CC based on the gain, okay, then you will have to redesign the value of CC and you will find that it is actually more optimum than trying to use the value of CC for k equal to 1. Okay. So my question is which expressions will change now? Huh? Omega u. Okay. So the unity loop gain frequency now. What is it? Basically A naught P1 divided by K which is GM1 by K times CC. This is the only thing that changes. The zeros and poles inside the uh, system do not change at all. Okay. So all you have to do is So yeah, what happens to this equation now? What things will change here? Omega u becomes omega u loop, okay? So which means this whole thing becomes basically omega u of the op amp. When I say omega u, I mean it's only for the op amp. So it becomes omega u of the op amp divided by k times p2 then what else that's it is that it or is there something else how did we get the other terms g huh? one divided by k times gm2 because that comes from omega u by Z1, right? Omega U is now Omega U loop, which is GM1 divided by K times CC. So this term actually becomes smaller. So instead of GM1 by GM2, you get GM1 by K times GM2. Okay. Now assuming the same values of GM1 and GM2, this becomes smaller and smaller, and you will have negligible effect on the phase margin. Okay. So that's all that's there to it. It's exactly the same, except you have to substitute the right value of K. And if you have an inverting amplifier, you have uh, that k is basically not the gain itself, but 1 plus the gain magnitude. Right? Any questions here? Yeah, so then you would substitute k equals to 25. You will get a smaller value of uh, cc, obviously. That yeah. No, that depends actually. So there are, uh, uh, first of all, GM1 and GM2 have other things as well, depending on what load you connect, the amount of gain you get, etc. Et so that's how you choose GM2. Now, let's say you are designing an op amp on an IC where you have full control over everything, every op amp is unique and separate. Then, yes, so the way you choose GM1 and GM2 as well as uh, CC. Everything is up for grabs and you will use the right equation with the right value of k. Okay. Now, this is not very common now. There used to be something called externally compensated op amps where the CC would not be out inside. You would have two terminals to which you can connect CC. Now, of course, the op amp, the rest of the op amp is inside. So, GM1 and GM2 are fixed. All you have to do is choose the value of CC. So, if you look for uh, externally compensated op amps in Google, you will probably find some links. And I think, okay, they probably won't want you to sit and calculate all the quadratics. They'll probably give you the value of CC versus K or something. And then you can choose for the value of K, you can choose CC. But this is the equation that could have given them. That. Okay. Right. And by the way, I mean, we have been uh, looking at a simpler scenario where the feedback fraction is just a real number, 1 by K. Right. So we are assuming that we will make amplifiers. We could make actually frequency dependent networks using an op amp. So in this case, the feedback could be some 
f of s or something. So, for that you will have to design a different value of dc, ok. But if you uh, are using a standard op amp where uh, cc is fixed, you just have to make sure that you have to design f of s so that your whole system will be stable with whatever is inside the op amp, ok. Finally, you have to calculate the loop gain L of s and make sure that it behaves correctly, correctly meaning as the loop gain falls below unity, I mean where it crosses unity, the phase margin should not be as far negative as minus 180, ok. So, when you have frequency dependent feedback networks, you will have a more complex expression for loop gain, it will be the gain of the op amp times some other f of s, so the combined thing should have uh, that property. Right? Any other questions? So, please do all the problems in the tutorial carefully and mindfully also, I mean it is not just a matter of getting answers because especially these things right, these are a little more involved. You cannot let us say start solving this problem on quiz day assuming that I know the concept of frequency composition, it will almost certainly go wrong, ok. So, please do this in as many ways as you can think of, ok and think about the results, that way you will get a good feel for how to design these things and also how these feedback systems behave. And this is of uh, some practical importance in that let me see if I have the slides. <laughs> now, you will not be able to make any sense out of this, but what can you recognize in this CC? <laughs> yeah. So, This whole thing is the first uh, control source, ok. So, you have V e between these two and you get something over here, ok. And this whole thing here is the second control source, ok. and you can see cc across it, ok. So, it is actually used very much in practice and this last thing here in fact is the buffer, ok. Because you want to be able to connect all kinds of loads and then not have the op amp be affected, op amp behavior be affected by that, ok. So, let me, these things I mean usually I show in the analog circuits class, those of you who are still interested in taking it, you can see all this stuff and see how it works, it is not that complicated. So, you can see another op amp, different but you can still see CC right. So, yet another op amp looks more complicated but you can still see CC. <laughs> more complicated but you can see 10 picofarad of CC there. So, you can look up the data sheets yourself, actually modern data sheets do not have as much information as the previous one, previously they would even give the whole schematic, but you can get the, all of these things and see that. So, this thing that we did, this Miller compensated op amp, it is not just a more painful exam problem, it is of great practical importance. If you make uh, 3 stage op amp, this is more or less what you do, you will have 3 stages, you will have one Miller cap around the third stage, another one between across the second and third stages and so on, ok. So, it is uh, immensely practical thing, ok. And if you do this and you know something about transistors, you pretty much know how to design an op amp, ok. Ok, please do the tutorial.